Okay, well, it's um, 101. I can see a good crowd has joined us. I recognize some of my colleagues and um, partners um, and look forward to this session. My name is Ben Eggleton. I'm a professor at the University of Sydney and I'm here today speaking to you as director of the University of Sydney Nano Institute. Um, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. As I'm sitting on the Camperdown campus, I'm sitting on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. And if you're sitting um, at home, you might want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that you're sitting on uh, at this moment. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, this is an event that we've been planning um, for a while. Um, really uh, delighted to host um, um, Professor Lydia Rowaska, and I'm going to ask my colleague Corinne to introduce Lydia formally in a second. Um, all I would say is that this is a topic that's very timely for obvious reasons, uh, globally, nationally, also very timely for City Nano, uh, given that late last year we announced one of our grand challenge initiatives, which has a focus on uh, the topic that Lydia will be describing. And that uh, grand challenge initiative uh, is led by my colleague, Corinne Kayo. And over to you, Corinne, to introduce Lydia. I look forward to this fascinating session. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ben, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Corinne Cayo. I'm a professor in the School of Medical Sciences, Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. Today, this is my great pleasure to host the first lecture of the year for the Sydney Nano Distinguished Lecture Series. And I would like you to uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Distinguished Professor Lydia Moroska, who is going to address a very important question today um, which is around why is clean air an unmet challenge and will the pandemic help to change this? Um, a few words about Lydia, because I think you have an amazing um, track record, uh, Lydia. You are a distinguished professor at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. Um, Lydia is the director of the International Laboratory for Air Quality and Health, which is a collaboration, a collaborative center of the World Health Organization and you are an advisor as well for this organization. Um, by training, you are a physicist, but the research you are conducting is really truly multidisciplinary, trying to really find solutions around understanding better, uh, you know, um, the science of airborne particles and as well the impact on health and the uh, environment. Um, maybe what I would like just to say, you've published an amazing amount of, of papers, but very recently uh, you have co-chaired a group of experts which developed the new World Health Organization, Organization Air Quality Guidelines. And this was released very recently in September uh, 2021. So really, I, I just want to say welcome and to give you 40 to 45 minutes um, to talk about um, the, the challenges we, we are facing around air quality. Uh, Lydia, I would like to ask everyone to mute, please. And if you have any questions, please use the, the chat. And um, um, you can, um, once he has finished, just, I can read your question. So please feel free to raise your hand and ask directly your question. Lydia, the floor is Many yours. thanks, Corinne and Ben for inviting me. Uh, to give this uh, presentation and for introducing me. The first question is, can you see my screen? <laughs> right. Uh, why is clean air an unmet challenge and will the pandemic help change this? Uh, I'm sure that if you read the little abstract for my presentation, you noticed a ma uh, some mention about application of whatever technologies, not only uh, to, to the Earth's um, uh, dealings, but also to Mars. And I wonder that many of you may be thinking, will I be talking about Mars and application of what we are doing to Mars? Perhaps yes. And if so, you are perhaps looking much more um, with bigger interest to these Mars issues than to anything to, with, to do with boring buildings. Can there be anything interesting about buildings? Well, to this extent, I can present some installation we already have here at QT. Uh, in relation to uh, future Mars uh, exploration and buildings. 
Doesn't it look uh, impressive? Well, uh, unfortunately, I can't see your faces, and you are not sure. I'm not sure whether you are thinking, well, look great, this looks really uh, futuristic. Um, but I have to disappoint you. This is just ventilation system at one of the buildings here at QT. It does look futuristic. So the reality is that when we are talking about future building technologies, we should to acknowledge that we already have advanced building technologies to provide us with clean air. So what's missing? Why, the, why there are still problems? Well, we could talk about this uh, not for 40 minutes, but it could be a whole semester lecture series. So I just um, picked up on some of the issues humans as a source of pathogens, dynamic of indoor air processes, mitigation, science and technology, enforceable indoor air quality standards, and vision for the future. I'll be kind of painting a general picture, but with vision for the future, is this a new vision or an old vision? I'll also touch upon this. So, when we are talking about indoor air, which is basically indoor atmosphere, the first thing we have to acknowledge that it's much more complex than outdoor atmosphere in terms of understanding, because it's not only affected by what's happening outdoor uh, in terms of meteorology, outdoor pollution, but all the aspects related to what's happening in, in buildings and indoor air building sources. I'll mention later some of these aspects, but I'll focus now on indoor air sources and one specific source, um, because this is related to, to, to our top. And also something to mention that energy, when we're talking about the uh, buildings, energy is a big factor of this. So what is this specific, um, uh, as a specific source we are going to talk about? humans as a source. And the reason for this is that, well, during the pandemic, this has been the main interest. So um, how does it work? Particle aerosolization in respiratory activities. We can say that it results from the passage of an air stream at a sufficiently high uh, speed over a surface of a liquid. Now, where is this air stream and where is the liquid? in our respiratory tract or in many different parts of this respiratory tract. I often say that it um, can be compared um, to the processes occurring in this old fashioned uh, perfume bottle or a nebulizer we use for many different uh, purposes. But uh, what's happening in our respiratory tract is far more complicated than in this what's happening in nebulizer. And in fact, we are not talking just about our realization, but we are talking about generation processes and, and same are different in the nature. So in brief, if we look what's happening in different parts of the respiratory tract, starting from the lower parts, here we've got a different process to, uh, aer to uh, aerosolization. Namely, this is blockage of air passage during uh, exhalation and then burst, then when they, um, uh, during inhalation, they open and as a result of burst, the particles are formed. Slightly different processes occurring in, uh, in the upper part, in larynx, here is vocalization and vocal, uh, vocal cords vibration, which is one of the processes leading to particle formation. And then uh, in the mouth, again, um, something a bit different, uh, the interaction uh, with um, uh, during speaking, speech articulation with the tongue and so on. So just, and this is very simplistic um, uh, sort of this uh, description of this, but you can see how complex it is. And this is not the end of the complexity because after these particles are formed wherever in the respiratory tract, before they are emitted, they all already, there are already changes occurring to them. And in particular, as they travel upwards, there's deposition. So already the size distribution changes to what was, um, to, to the way we're generated. 
There was a fascinating paper published a year ago on surface deformation published in science and this um, fish, the bubble collapse and formation of the particles, which was pointed out that could also be related to this process. Now, how do we know about this? Do we know this from in vivo experiments? Do we send any sort of nano devices to look at uh, what's happening there? No, there's no way to in vivo study what's happening there. So whatever we know, it's based on modeling or what we measure outside after emission. But the complexity of this is really mind boggling what's happening there. So characteristics of the particles, and this is based on what we measure after the particles are emitted. And here, there's a lot of misconception, uh, which I realized at, at the beginning of the pandemic, when many particularly medical colleagues were saying, oh, bring your, med bring your particle counter and we'll do some testing, we'll do some emissions of something, mask testing or something. It's far more complicated than this if you really want to do it properly and quantitatively. So in our first study, there was a lot of thinking how to do it. And the decision was to do it in this way, in this flow tunnel where the person was uh, sitting and exhaling with air flow gently um, from, from behind the head, um, filtration of the air. Now, the reason it was done like this, because this way we knew exactly what was the age of the particles formed and there was no mixing of old and new particles. Also, we needed to use a number of different instruments because, as you'll see in a moment, large range um, um, size of these particles. So anything to do basically with instrumental techniques to, to measure particles emitted is very complex. But despite of this, again, we have, based on the studies we conducted here in Brisbane, but also studies conducted by many other colleagues, we have a reasonably good idea of uh, what's emitted, um, what are the size ranges. So this is an example of size distribution of particles resulting from uh, speaking and breathing. So the first what you can notice here is on the horizontal axis is how large a uh, range of these particles is logarithmic scale. And we are talking about four decades of cycles. We can also notice that the, despite this, the majority of the particles are in this smaller range, say roughly below 10 micrometers. And we can see this because the vertical scale is log uh, logarithmic as well. We can see that this distribution is, um, well, quite complex and have several modes. So the first one is related to this uh, bronchiolar fluid film burst that's in the deepest part of the respiratory tract, the smallest particles. And actually this was uh, linked to the generation of H5N1 uh, virus because its location in that part of the um, uh, respiratory tract. The slightly bigger mode is laryngeal vibration mode and the biggest one and the, uh, the widest one is oral speech articulation. And this again was um, related to H1 and 1. Now you can say, okay, this is a nice size distribution. Uh, does it come from just you use whatever instrument uh, and then voila, we had put it on the graph? Um, no, to get to this stage required about 10 data processing steps from different instruments and taking into account all kinds of things. Also, uh, I'm pointing out to the logarithm, to the scale here, this is particle number concentration. I'll come back to this in a moment. Now, another question is the concentration or emission rates uh, of particles from these activities. So again, from this uh, same study, we compared uh, emissions from breathing, nose, mask, counting, voice, whisper, and, and so on. And what we can see that all the activities results in generation of particles, but vocalization significantly higher numbers, and particularly this, which was the closest to singing, this was ah. So this is very significant. 
Um, as I said, other colleagues did um, studies, um, similar studies like the group of Asadi, and they came to very similar conclusions. So as I said, we have a reasonably good idea what's emitted, what are the concentrations as, and from what activities. Now you can ask, okay, where are the path pathogens or where is the virus in these particles? Well, this virus, because that's the virus we are talking about, SARS-CoV-2 naked virus is um, about 0.12 micrometer, but it is never naked in the particle, in these particles, because the way it is generated, arborization or other processes, is in, encapsulated in a water particle. So there's also water mucus salts, which means that the particle carrying the virus is bigger than the virus itself. So the virus is not naked. How much bigger? Well, the studies uh, of this virus showed that the majority of the load, viral load, is in particles smaller than one micrometer. It doesn't mean that individual particle carrying the virus uh, has such a huge load, but because the concentration of the small particles is far, far higher than larger particles, so overall, these particles contain the highest uh, load. So, Conclusion majority within the uh, mid submicrometer range or larger. Now, this is the study by um, one of the studies by uh, Santarpia and colleagues, uh, and this was done differently to our study, which was laboratory study. It was done in actual rooms with COVID patients. And uh, what they did, they used similar instrumentation to what we used, or one of the instruments, or dynamic particle sizer. Uh, however, they also used a NIOSH sampler, and this is to collect particles for micro uh, the viral uh, analysts. So in this case, they uh, included well all respiratory activities and the background because that was in the in the room. Uh, also, there were several data processing steps before they got to this nice um, size distribution. Now, something to note here is the scale. Again, because you may say this, this diagram looks differently to, uh, to the one which I showed a moment ago. Now, in this case, we've got mass distribution. So mass is proportional to the radius or diameter to the third power. Therefore, this mold, the bigger, the uh, larger size mold looks much bigger, but, but of course, mass of these larger particles, even so there are few of them, is much larger than the smaller particles. Nevertheless, the most important aspect is that the highest viral load they found in this NIOSH um, stage below one micrometer. So what happens with these particles after they are emitted, particle dynamics uh, in the air? Well, the first and the most important process is particle evaporation. They contain water and they move from an environment which is warm and uh, with 100% um, relative humidity. Some years ago, I did a simple calculation showing what happens to particles of the sizes 1, 10, and um, 100 micrometers at different relative humidity. Uh, and some of these particles, that blue line, is those containing um, sodium chloride solution, similar to what uh, is in our saliva. Well, the bottom line is that these curves disappear very quickly, a fraction of a second, which means that these particles evaporate very, very quickly. Even the particles which are 100 micrometers evaporate quickly. Of course, uh, the real particles are much more complex. So, um, so this, the whole process is uh, more complex and eventually, it's been shown they evaporate to about 20 to 40% um, percent of the initial size. But again, they evaporate very, very fast. So in the reality, what we measure is already what's called droplet nuclei, that's the terminology used. But I must say that out of all what's happening to the particles in the air, this is by far the most complex process and potentially with the highest impact on what happens to the virus. Because that evaporation means there's also increase of uh, salinity of the, um, uh, of, of the uh, particle. As a result of this, sometimes this crystallization of the salt 
and the impact of is again on the virus. So it's again one of the mind-boggling processes what, what's happening there. Well, otherwise, uh, particle fate in the air is quite well understood. Um, there's often this conception that the particles fall on the ground. But since we are talking at this very small particles, the falling on the ground applies only to a small number of them. Now, and it's not new science. This is a summary of a work of Wells, uh, 1974. Wells, the kind of father of this, uh, this area of science. And if you, can, if you can look at these particles of our interest, 10, one micrometers, which are the, in the majority, the falling time is well, 300 seconds or 30,000 seconds. So they're not falling, they are floating in the air because of everything, we, all, all forces and processes acting on them. Now, uh, I like this uh, diagram because it shows uh, it shows the concept uh, that, of course, we are not going to go through equations of what's uh, what's happening. The, we have the uh, virtual origin, so it's in the respiratory tract, the emission from the mouse, and then this is the plume of the air uh, emitted air with the particles floating up with some larger particles dropping down. So basically, here the key element is flow dynamics, and there's plenty of elements of flow dynamics in in every interior. So basically what we are talking about is uh, when referring to airborne transmission is inhalation of virus laden particles from anywhere in the space. So if we have um, here an infected person and susceptible people at different uh, distances. So um, what often is referred to airborne transmission is this past that magical one meter or one kangaroo apart but really it is everywhere in the space. So, so in the proximity to the infected person, like in the proximity to, uh, to any source, the concentration of everything is the highest, the dynamics is the fastest. This settles um, down at a distance, but as I said, this is inhalation from any uh, location in the space. So with this uh, physics, we can summarize the physics of respiratory infections. Um, we have quantitative evidence of basically all these processes, characteristics of the particles, what happens to the particles in the air, the position of the particles. I didn't talk about this in the respiratory tract. So we can say, all right, is such evidence available during every outbreak? Sure, it should be. Well, not at all, because during the outbreak, there's no one to monitor these processes. And the number of parameters needed for this is such that even if there were people monitoring, it would be difficult to, um, to get all these parameters. So what are we going to do about, uh, or what are, what are we doing about outbreaks? This is coming from different uh, types of modeling. And I'll just mention a, a few of them. So this is a modeling of the outbreak of Scully Valley Choir uh, in the United States. That was one of the first uh, outbreak reported when well, a huge number of people were infected, 53 out of 61. And the model, I'll mention briefly this model later, um, risk assessment model, which requires some quanta concentration and probability of infection we've used. Um, and the most important aspect of this was that the model results agreed very well with the outbreak data. A very different modeling was conducted in relation to um, this outbreak, which was the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Here, the um, researchers looked not only at what's in the air, but also at other aspects, and in particular, fomite, which is object. And they apportioned the um, infections, estimated infection contribution, dependent on the transmission mode. With this short range, um, slightly lower than long range, by long range that's, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, larger than one meter, fomites play a uh, smaller role. Now, very different modeling was uh, done uh, in this study. It is still on a reprint. And here, they, they looked at 12 modeled and documented outbreaks data, modeled blue and documented red. And the most important is that the assumption they used is that 
all cases were caused by uh, well airborne transmission. And as you can see, in most cases, this uh, blue and red um, are very close together. So basically, the conclusion was that there was an agreement in nine cases. Well, pointing out to the significance of uh, airborne transmission. Which means, uh, if that's the case, airborne transmission must be mitigated and where the world is slowly getting to the realization of this. So let's mitigate this. And uh, when this uh, realization comes, the first comes, okay, let's do something, open the window. So um, this is the latest recommendation from the uh, WHO. Good ventilation protects from you from COVID-19 infection. When you look at these images and what's recommended, basically it is all around the window open the window. So how to open the window, you can put a fan in front of the window and so on. So, so we are talking basically about ventilation, natural ventilation, relying on opening the window. But first, I'd like to say that it is hardly a novel concept. If, our, if we are coming to this realization, this was already reported by Florence Nightingale. She was one of the pioneers of this and uh, discussing the need of ventilation that was in relation to treating uh, patients. So we are only 160 years behind um, in this realization, well, better um, later than never. So let's talk for a moment about natural ventilation. Let's open the window concept, which is the, the case of in homes, schools, restaurants, shops. Most of our homes will rely on ventilation basing on opening the windows. So when it's not too cold, too hot, too noisy, that's then fine, the windows are open. But the reality is that in most uh, climates, most of the time, there are some issues, either too, co too cold, too hot, too noisy. So this means that there's basically no ventilation, which can be, we can put equation mark, natural ventilation means at a long period of time, there's no ventilation. So this, I would say, this is like in this um, kid's fairy tale, the emperor's new clothes, this, the king is naked, there's no ventilation. Of course, a disclaimer here, when I say no ventilation, this means minimal ventilation, because there's always some leaking of the air through the, uh, through the building envelope and, uh, and uh, uh, dependently how buildings are constructed. So there's always some air uh, getting inside, but very, very little. All right, so how to improve indoor air quality without ventilation or with that minimum ventilation? And we are talking, since we are during the pandemic, so the focus is on the infection transmission. But I'm sure you've heard a lot about the use of filter-based air cleaners, air purifiers. Uh, they are being bought for schools, they are being recommended. Uh, will this work? Well, uh, there's no doubt that it will, if they are properly operate properly, means the right size of purifier for the space and so on. They will work. Um, there have been many papers published on this. And this is not rocket science. They filter the air, so the particles are the, uh, the particles are contained in the um, contain the virus so are filtered out. They will also um, help uh, with another issue, namely with uh, any outdoor air pollution, like for example bushfires. You can't quite see this, but this is a WHO document published was a year and a half ago. Uh, there was some communication and this was part of this document um, as well. So it will work. But if we buy tens, uh, hundreds, thousands of this air purifier and well, what's going to happen with them after the pandemic? Just a thought. Many of them will end up uh, as electronic waste. But aside of this, there's another issue. Now, uh, CO2, VOCs, and other gaseous indoor generated pollutants will still accumulate because there's no ventilation. 
I heard that was, um, was it this one of the government departments in Victoria and somebody from this department saying that the air purifiers don't work because they don't filter CO2. Well, they don't filter CO2 because CO2 is a, is a gas, so they won't filter it. So this is not going to resolve the issue. Are these gaseous pollutants a problem? Well, they've been uh, tons of papers published on this, starting with uh, the impact of um, indoor CO2 concentrations on cognitive function and showing how important it is. Now think of the classrooms uh, with no ventilation, 30 kids, CO2 accumulating, six hours the kids spend there and they get sleepy and for academic performance of the kids. It's not an ideal situation. But there are also many other issues, organic compounds and the whole organic chemistry um, happening in indoors, uh, secondary uh, products, gaseous products uh, form indoors. So the issue is that uh, air cleaners without ventilations are not a solution. So it's part of the, of the issue. Now, uh, We'll discuss some other cleaning options, but I first will talk about um, a bit more about mechanical ventilation. Now, mechanical ventilation, here we are talking about um, mitigation science and technology. So it's not just open, a, uh, open the window, but also technologies which we have for this. And uh, we can call them as a general uh, class building engineering controls. This is schematically presented here on this diagram. So we are talking about sufficient and effective ventilation, avoiding recirculation, particle filtration, that's what I've just mentioned, air disinfection, I'll talk about this, overcrowding. So all of this uh, is schematically um, generated, um, presented here. I'll just talk for a moment about this issue, sufficient and effective ventilation. What is sufficient and effective ventilation? Sufficient enough of it? and effective everywhere in the room, and air is not flowing from one person to another. Like in this diagram, it's definitely not enough ventilation because these particles are everywhere. Here it's a bit better, but still there's unidirectional flow. So uh, what is the sufficient ventilation? Well, depends what document you read. Uh, minimum recommended ventilation rates according to the WHO for non-residential settings, 10 liters per second per person. If you look at the main, uh, main document in the, or standards in the United States, ASHRAE, there's a big long table and uh, in particular those two values, 9.5 and 4 liters per person per second for an art class and lecture hall, um, hall with fixed seats. Why such a big difference? Well, because in an art class, potentially there are some pollutants generating from the art materials. Riva, the European, um, follows the same uh, advice as the WHO. All right, now, two issues here. How will the building space know the number of people inside? So if we are talking about 10 liters per person, how do they know how many people are inside and what they are doing, sitting quietly or uh, painting uh, or, um, yeah, or, or painting. And also what's the adequate risk for infection transmission for different pathogens and for different variants? So with the first issue, um, if we look at this um, schematic diagram from our um, science paper last year, the buildings and S, so this is something uh, which would be good to be happening, demand control ventilation, but normally is not used. It's normally the design occupancy. So if the design occupancy, so if there are, if, um, if there are more than designed for, there's under ventilation. If there are less than designed for, waste of energy, but the building doesn't know this. And then also uh, activities in the room, what people are doing, um, whether sitting at the computer or, um, or talking, like in this diagram, the building doesn't know this. And then if talking, there's emissions. And again, um, the 
building doesn't know this. So, uh, so this is one aspect the building doesn't know. Now, but still the issue of what is, the, what is sufficient ventilation in relation to infection transmission? Well, can we use this, this uh, guidelines or standards, which I just mentioned, uh, which are to control um, other pollutants, in particular controlling um, CO2 concentrations, uh, which we all uh, emit all the time? Well, it's not that simple because for this, we need to use the risk assessment models and tools. It's very different to other pollutants. And the principal concept of this is infectious quanta. And quanta is the dose of infectious airborne particles required to cause in infection in 33% of susceptible persons. Uh, for, for basically, it's Poisson distribution, that's the agreement. Now, unlike, for example, carbon dioxide, which we can quantify quite well, emitted quanta depend on lots of different things. The location of the pathogen the respiratory tract, physiology, stage of the disease, type of the respiratory activity, speaking or breathing the virus, and also its variants. Think of the Delta or Omicron. So again, but this has been done in the past risk assessment uh, calculation using this very simple well trialing model. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to discuss it more, but just to, for you to see what parameters come into, into the model, which is basically the number of infectious source cases, the number of infectious quanta, uh, respiratory ventilation, exposure duration, and the um, air supply to the buildings. So we had this, uh, and well, we use this, um, for example, uh, in this little study we done some years ago, uh, calculated ventilation and in infection risk in a, um, a Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane for influenza, tuberculosis, and rhinovirus, and well, sh uh, showing that the higher the outdoor air exchange rate, the uh, lower the infection risk, and dramatically lower on um, a logarithmic scale. During this pandemic, this whole area of risk assessment models and tools expanded significantly. So it's not just now based on this simple equation, but using also the size distribution like this, uh, which I've shown you and many other aspects. Um, so we've developed this airborne infection risk calculator, um, which, uh, which has been already used for many applications in, well, in, in this particular paper. And again, I'm, I'm not going to show how you can use this risk calculator to assess the risk. It was recommended, for example, in, by the Italian government to, um, as an assessment means. Uh, one small problem here is, which we can uh, um, sort of um, pretend that doesn't exist for a while, it's uniform mixing. There's assumption here that AI is uniformly mix, mixed, which is not often the case. All right, so we have a solution to control the risk of infection, right? So we use a model, we uh, calculate the um, required ventilation rate, set up ventilation, and is it that easy? Well, not really, not really, because since every setting is different, the model should be run for every venue. Can you see at every school, shop, gym, Every office will run the model, unlikely. But also new pathogens um, uh, could appear and we won't know the emitted quanta, which is the key parameters. Like when Omicron appeared what, three months ago, we didn't have a clue what's the, what are the emitted quanta. So it's then not possible. But also there's another issue. How much ventilation would actually be needed if we use these models? So to, to do this, we've done some sort of more detailed calculations. And, and this was to calculate the individual risk of an exposed person or the event reproduction number, which I'm sure by this stage of the pandemic, everybody uh, knows uh, what it is. And uh, we've done this uh, using the um, sort of typical classroom and uh, military barracks for which they were very detailed information. 
and calculated ventilation for three settings, low, medium, and high, and as assumed one first. So the first, what came up when we put all these things together uh, was the huge difference in predictive quanta emission rates. And uh, we did this for, for different pathogens. So when we look at this for standing and speaking, we can see that this um, um, uh, reproductive uh, predictive quanta emission rate is hugely different. And this, it's, it's quite high for SARS-CoV-2 compared to other infections, but this was for the wild variety. For, the, um, for Omicron, is higher than measles. So basically, what we've shown that, um, I'm just showing the classroom here, uh, so um, these are the resting, oral breathing, standing, speaking, ventilation rate, uh, high, medium, low. The most significant is this bit. So if we look at the event reproduction number, bigger than one, larger than one, which means that the infection will continue. So for these viruses, even at high ventilation rate, the reproduction number is higher than one. So the reality is that there are limits of ventilation. And as I said, for this um, um, viruses and even more for Omicron, even at this very high, basically not achievable ventilation rate in many venues, this, we cannot uh, prevent the spread of infection. Well, a very novel concept, uh, not so. Uh, this paper by uh, Ed Nardell was published quite a long ago, and if you look at this theoretical limit uh, of uh, protections um, achievable in buildings, so there are limits. Well, what to do? There is another option, disinfecting the air in situation of such pathogens. Now, disinfecting the air in a way that no additional pollution is generated indoors. So uh, when we are using um, particle filter, filters, there are no pollution generated. But if, for example, we are ionizing the air, yes, there are additional pollutants generated. But one solution, which is, um, well, free of these problems, uh, is germicidal uh, EUV air disinfection. Low energy does not generate pollutants, silent and robust, which means low maintenance, low cost. So in particular, um, a lot, there's a lot of discussion now about far UV, which is safe uh, with very low penetration. So in principle, if we had this in shared spaces, it could be doing to the air what is done to the water. Basically, every drop of water we drink is disinfected. So again, application of GUV, a very novel concept, not so. Um, uh, the discussion started quite a while ago, so we're only 76 years behind now. Uh, now, a few words uh, which uh, on this little topic, which I was trying to avoid so far, effective ventilation, the airflow distribution. I've been saying about this uniform mixing, but in this infamous case on the Guangzhou restaurant, uh, there was very low ventilation rate, full stop. But this air condition was turning air in this circular motion. He is an, in the infected person, and this red are people who were infected. So in this case, this case demonstrated that the flow direction was a problem in this case, in addition to air flow supply. So, we have CFD models which can um, help with uh, resolving airflow direction, but uh, they are specific to indoors, to indoors how to generate. So this is using effective ventilation is still a challenge and we still have no means for generalization. So the last little bit is enforceable indoor air quality standards. Uh, Corinne mentioned this document, uh, air quality um, guidelines uh, introduced by the, w, by the WHO uh, last September. Um, I'm not going to talk about the specifics of them, 
But one important aspect mentioned and strongly stated in the documents that they apply to outdoor and indoor air. Now, the challenge is the link between the indoor and outdoor air, which I mentioned before. If we are dealing with any indoor environment, so we have to take into account what's happening outdoors, but also indoors. Like in this paper, a few years ago, we showed that the difference between home, um, school and office in terms of where particles, particle number or particle mass come from in terms of the different sources, indoor, outdoor. So, but the reality is the management of air quality uh, based on WHO air quality guidelines is such that most countries have outdoor air quality standards based on WHO air guidelines, but most countries do not have indoor air quality standards. Do you know that Australia does not have indoor air quality standards? Anything can be in indoor air. So indoor air quality is really um, regulatory no man's land. Now, there are many issues, but monitoring is a key element of enforcement. Can we do monitoring? A few years ago, we published this paper, this paper on real-time sensors for indoor air monitoring. And we concluded that um, the awareness of indoor air quality risk and availability of regulations is lacking between the technologies. We were quite optimistic about the technologies. But since then, we worked on low-cost sensors, and we worked with, um, with Ben and his group on this. Yes, we have low-cost sensors. We can use them for research. But they are not still yet such that they can use in every indoor environment. So we need indoor air uh, enforceable standards such that concentration of sele at least selected pollutants. I'm not saying all of those which are in indoor um, WHO guidelines are measured in every indoor space. So the vision for the future to finish is we need to mit mitigate all air risk indoors. I was talking a lot about um, airborne infection, but also we know that it's the issue of what's coming from outside, bushfires, what generated inside, thermal comfort, issues like um, dampness and mold. All this has to be taken into account at the stage of building design, design of heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, building operation, and taking into account energy. So to this extent, if you look at this complexity, I'm not going to run through the details of this, that's what's happening in dwellings on Earth, and this is simplification. Isn't this uh, much simpler on Mars? On Mars, there's no relation with outdoor atmosphere. So if we, whatever we develop on Earth will be applicable to Mars. So the vision for the future, there will be no naturally ventilated spaces, homes that have no ventilation, indoor air quality standards will prescribe concentrations of indoor pollutants and be enforceable. Ventilation as part of the HVAC system will be an element in the enforcement of indoor air quality um, and ventilation in shared spaces will be supplemented by what I expect will be GUV to control airborne risk infection. Reflection. Um, it took 2000 years from the time asbestos was recognized as a health risk during Roman times for regulations against asbestos to be introduced. I hope it will not take thousands of years before we have good indoor air quality in our interiors. Well, hope is not a strategy. So we are working, we are all working towards um, lessons from this pandemic to be implemented. So we are in a better situation, not during the next pandemic, but every time. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Lydia, for this presentation. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. There's so much in it. I think 
at least I will need to reflect on it and to think about it for <laughs> a few days, a few weeks. Um, but yeah, really very, very interesting. What I would like to tell to everyone is that feel free to write your question in the chat, but even better to raise your hand and ask your question yourself. Um, so I'm just, um, yeah, looking at the chat and any end that would be raised. Um, maybe just before I ask Nick to ask his question, what I would like just to mention, Lydia, is that when we were working on our grand challenge um, last year, uh, and this is how we started our presentation, is the fact that many of the strategies we've been using in the past two years have been tested or put in place so many years ago. So I was like, it's unbelievable with all the, you know, the technology and the science, we are still relying on quarantine and, and, the, and the, the same thing. So I think it's really the time to, to move forward. And the other thing, because my background is exercise science, I'm like, I feel like all of the guidelines are really based on a stat static human, but we are animals and I think pretty, I mean, except maybe in classroom and maybe we'll have to change that, but most of the time we are active in, in rooms, in, indoors. And uh, sometimes we even do exercise. So I guess it's maybe adding a layer on, on the challenge. Um, so Nick, yeah, feel free to ask your question. Yeah, thank you for a great talk, Lydia. Um, a lot of <clears throat> very challenging issues there. Um, I, I just wondered um, if you'd actually done any work with the aviation authorities like ICAO about um, air quality inside aircraft as more and more of us are flying. Um, this is clearly a consideration as well. Well, um, this, is, um, this is a good question. Now, one point, first point is that in Australia, we don't have a manufacturing. So we've got, we don't have avi aviation industry. So normally what happens, and that my uh, experience with car industry, that such industries don't want necessarily to work with foreign uh, organizations. I was one, well, once uh, invited by Volvo to share that was about ultra fine particles and so on. So they were interested, but not to the point to actually working with an Australian university. But during this pandemic, we were approached by several aviation uh, companies with an interest. But most of this was just to clarify or, uh, something about our papers, because that papers, which, uh, um, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning of my talk about size distribution of particles from respiratory activities, these were the first papers. And there are still few papers which gave such a detailed information about the distribution. So they wanted to use this for their work on designing, well, safer um, aviation uh, interiors. So we had conversation, we clarified, we provided them with some data, but that was the extent really of working with them. They never followed in, in actually working, but well, that's all right, it, that's how it is, but it's good that, when, that the aviation industry in general is looking seriously in this. So that, that's what I definitely can say that they look into this. That, that, that's interesting because um, I think ICAO actually has um, some standards for the amount of um, air per passenger. And I think it's way, way below what you're talking about. But that, that would be an interesting area. But thank you for the answer. Thanks. And, and I think, Nick, it may be based mostly on CO2, like CO2 concentration and oxygen concentration potentially in the aircraft as well. Yeah, potentially because the aircraft are pressurized. So that's probably part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, thank you, Lydia, for a, such a clear and informative presentation. It was terrific. Um, talking about air conditioning design, um, you know, I've been thinking about this issue as well. The conventional air conditioning approach is mixing ventilation, which is probably the worst <laughs> approach to this problem. And, um, but it's not the only approach. There are different uh, strategies for moving conditioned air through an occupied space. And um, do you have any ideas about what you would regard as a, a, a better way of delivering conditioned air? Well, um, well, first of all, hello, Richard. We haven't seen each other for a long time. It's good to see you. On this good to see you too. <laughs> Well, um, in one of the presentations, when I talked uh, more about this issue of ventilation, when I said limits of ventilation, I added one more word, uh, limits to mixing ventilation. 
because that's basically as far as we can go with mixing ventilation and mixing ventilation is certainly not helping as there are many better designs. In that little schematic diagram from our, our paper, I, I showed other de designs. So in particular, air flowing from below or from the sides going upwards. So this way it's not mixing ventilation. And in this particular st situation, so it was not only that it was not distributing um, peep, uh, air from one person to another, but also because it's got several um, uh, um, inlets. So um, it's more efficient and less energy is used. But then the last of these uh, panels was personalized ventilation. Uh, now, I must say that, well, personalized ventilation is, uh, personalized ventilation is not a new concept. Uh, Ole Fanger, I'm sure you will know him very well in Denmark, he was probably the one who was uh, promoting this topic. And he was, he was just, he had very poetic description how you want the personal ventilation, like you drink clean, clean champagne, you drink this clean, clean air. And I was then thinking, well, this is kind of utopia. Why do we need to go to that extent? A particular thinking of situations when if you have the, um, that personal ventilation, it would be, well, flow, um, fast flow near your face, which could be annoying as well. But they could, this could be done much better. And now, um, this issue of personal ventilation, well, delivering clean air to the breathing zone, saving much more energy, this is really one of the one of the designs to look into. It will be a bit challenging because it, the, the whole interior will still have to have some kind of ventilation, whether displacement, mixing or whatever. So this personalized ventilation will be delivered basically on demand. Uh, if an individual presses a button or the building sees where the person is. And this flow generated by personalized ventilation will have to will work with the flow of the air in the building. But uh, this is really the future and so something to we should well all work to design properly. Thank you. Uh, Lydia, I'm not sure we have other hands up. I mean, there's a question in the yes, chat. Yeah, yes, absolutely. There's a question in the chat. Jennifer, I don't want, I don't know if you wanted to ask the question yourself. Uh, otherwise, I can. Um, and, and I guess the question is around, um, you know, from what we know and with your modeling, uh, Lydia, shall we still be, you know, singing all standing and singing all together in the same room? Um, and I think it, it's it's a bit like you know exercise, like how do we now that we know there's risk for a number of different activities indoor how do we move forward knowing that you know the ventilation is not I guess state of the art how do we get back to shall we say oh we don't do that anymore or we have to sing outdoor or how do we mitigate the risk in those um, when we want to get back to I guess normal quite quickly in the coming months. Well, basically, I'm talking about two scales here, one time scales, one time scale, what, what we are doing now to prevent uh, infection now during this pandemic. And I compare this situation, what do you do if, you're, uh, if it's a leak from the ceiling during a storm, you put a bucket and you collect water so it doesn't flood the room. So we do whatever we can. We go outside, we, we spread apart, uh, we open windows doors to create a flurry of, uh, of flows. So we do whatever we can. But in a longer term, we need to fix the roof. Uh, and that's why what, what, I, what I'm talking about, in the longer term, we need to have better designs. So it's not to, to make people quiet, not singing, not being together, because we are human, we should be doing these things. But our the system, indoor systems should be such that they will protect us or significantly lower the risk of, of, of any of the risks. So this is our long-term vision for the future. Well, thank you. I think it's a, it's a fabulous answer. Uh, Lydia, and uh, because it's uh, talking about what we do now and how we project ourselves in the future. And I think we are getting to the end of this session. So I don't know, Ben, if you want to just say a few words, but just amazing and hopefully yeah, we'll just continue the fabulous, conversation. Fabulous, Lydia. Appreciate your time. Really, Ripetine, uh, we'll follow up with you. Look forward to working with you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Looking forward to working with, with you as well. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.